The following is a presentation of KBTC Profiles. It's widely believed that the women's rights movement began in 1848 in, at Seneca Falls um, at the first women's rights convention. At that event, they produced a document called the Declaration of Sentiments in which they outlined all of the different ills that women were facing um, and all of their demands. That included equal uh, access to education, to more economic and professional opportunities, and most controversially, the right to vote. Even though the movement started in New York, it took hold in the West, and just because it took hold in the West doesn't mean that it wasn't um, really difficult. It took Washington 40 years of, um, of fighting to get the vote. And actually, we, we got it in 1883, which was very early. After having the vote for four years, it got taken away in 1887, and then we got it back in 1888, and then it was taken away again, so we like had two false starts. And then there was kind of a lull until 1910. In Washington State, our two like most prominent suffragists were Emma Smith DeVoe of Tacoma and May Arkwright Hutton of Spokane. Emma is this, you know, well-bred and very classy lady who has very feminine and she sings at her speeches. And, and then you've got May, who's like this tall, broad, like, you know, rags to riches, zebra coat wearing, hot rod driving, loud, like in your face. Their tactics are not the same. And so the two of them became, Emma became the president of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association and May Arkwright Hutton became the vice president. And so for a while they worked like very well together because they had the same goal, right? Get women the vote. But then their differences in like class and education and like political approaches started creating like a whole lot of kind of animosity between them and, and you know, it, it came to a head. Uh, they were fighting and bickering and you know, Emma Smith DeVoe was talking trash about, about May Ike Wright Hutton in the newspapers. It was taking away the focus of all this hard work that they were doing. After all of that controversy in the newspaper, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition was able to smooth out and, you know, reestablish the suffragists as a very serious and very like admirable um, organized movement. The Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition was a world's fair um, held in Seattle at the University of Washington in 1909. Every group that you can imagine was represented at this at this fair, and there were almost four million people who had come who had come through that exposition. And the suffragists knew that that was going to be a huge PR campaign opportunity for them, and so they pulled out all the stops. They had programs. They were speaking in churches. They made a cookbook. And they also sent a group of suffragists to climb Mount Rainier with a Votes for Women pendant. And they summited to the top and they planted their Votes for Women and AYP flag. And, you know, doing things like that further convinces, you know, or changes the public mind about like what it is that women can do. It was huge. It was huge for them. It was, I think, you know, more than any other push, AYP probably gave Washington like it's what it needed to to get the vote which they did like the following year. I think what's striking when you look back on the suffrage movement nationally or locally is just how long it took. Only two of the original signers of the Declaration of Sentiments lived long enough to see voting happen. Susan B. Anthony didn't see didn't live long enough to see it happen. And so you have to believe that even if, you know, it's not gonna happen in your lifetime, that these efforts, you know, make a difference, even if you aren't able to see it. It's a lesson in persistence. And um, yeah, it's the work is never done. KBTC profiles are available at kbtc.org.